All right. I have the great pleasure to introduce David Cavaniero. We've known each other for years. He is a member of the board of Seed Savers Exchange, but much more than that, whether you know or not, probably a lot of you know, he was our gardener, one of our most important gardeners for many, many years. And David's photography, we are so privileged to have the benefit of benefit of his photography is what has set the style for our catalogs and for our posters and all those wonderful things you see in the gift shop and go buy them that helps us okay um, all right so David is what you would call uh, not the jack-of-all-trades master of none but actually the jack of many trades he is a renaissance man and he masters whatever he tries and it's food it is vegetables, it is a wonderful seed collection, and a gardener like nobody's business. Anyway, so I'm introducing David Cavanero, and he's going to talk about food origins. Thank you, David. Thank you, Roz, very much. She's a great boss, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> We've been bossing each other around for a lot of years. <laughs> um, Thank you all for being here this uh, wonderful weekend. It's a privilege to uh, be doing the final sort of send off um, a little talk here. And I hope to kind of sum up uh, in, in one uh, quick journey uh, something about what this whole business is about. I tell people that I got involved in, in, in gardening entirely through the stomach. I come from a, a foodie family mostly uh, because of the matriarchy in the Italian line. Uh, my Italian grandmother, who weighed about 300 pounds and was always going on a diet tomorrow, um, <laughs> who made the most fantastic uh, ravioli and all the rest of it. Um, of course, every Italian meal started with garlic sauteing and olive oil in the frying pan. Uh, so naturally, I grew up assuming that Italians not only domesticated garlic, but actually even invented it, you know. <laughs> until I worked at Seed Savers and late one fall in a snowstorm, we got a box from John Swenson, our, our wonderful old uh, Seed Savers friend, longtime member, uh, John Swenson, who is an allium collector. And he had been overseas collecting garlics. So I was out there planting this incredible garlic collection. All the wonderful varieties you can now buy in commerce uh, mostly came from that collection that we planted out here in a snowstorm. And I was completely shocked to discover that Italy had nothing to do with any of it, that garlic originated in the dry mountainous regions of Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, and all these fantastic garlics that we grow came from villages in the Ukraine and Georgia and the Soviet Union. Uh, so that was my first comeuppance that made me realize once again how far and wide uh, have been the pathways through which we have received this incredibly rich food heritage. So this little journey today, I call it around the world in 80 minutes, except I don't even have 80 minutes. So uh, this is going to be a fast and furious world tour to just um, give us a sense of where all this mar marvelous food has come from and what that journey has been like. So we're going to start right here in Iowa. Um, I think that's Iowa, looks like it, <laughs> with the crop that we know most around here in these monocultures of a crop called corn. Um, we tend to think in America that, uh, that corn is an ind indigenous Native American crop. Well, it is and it isn't. Uh, we have all these wonderful corn varieties that Native Americans uh, across the, uh, the United States grew for a very long time. So here we have a Hopi elder uh, uh, working with uh, parching flower corn. We also uh, think of the um, uh, Three Sisters as a Native American agricultural system, the corn upon which the beans climbed and the squash grew around. Neither, none of these three crops originated in North America. Uh, they all come from farther south and migrated northward and became established in Native American, North American Native uh, agriculture. Uh, so we're going to follow the, the path of, of where some of these things come from. But let's first take a quick look at what crops actually 
uh, or what food plants actually are native to North America. And we're going to find out there are hardly any, believe it or not. This is a Native American grinding rock. And guess what they ground in that grinding rock? Acorns. Um, many of the original food crops of North America were wild harvested crops. They were never domesticated. Uh, a lot of the native tribes were food gathering tribes. Uh, acorns uh, were a staple, of course, for a very long time. So that's one of our native uh, uh, wild crops. Um, you all know about turkey at Thanksgiving. Turkey is one of our North American legacies. Um, the wild turkeys were eventually domesticated and, um, and now we have these incredible fat white birds that uh, they, they can not, not only not fly, they can't even mate without crushing one another. They're a, a pretty hopeless animal. But the wild turkeys, as we know, are magnificent uh, critters. Um, I mean, this is what the domesticated white turkey looks like. Why would you want to eat a creature like that? It's a <laughs> <coughs> but we do, and we all love them. And, uh, uh, but that's, uh, that's a, a crop that uh, the native peoples knew a lot about. Another wild harvested plant native to North America is the pine nuts that we love so much. These are the pinion pines of the Southwest. These are all wild harvested plants native to North America that were never really domesticated. Black walnuts, the native black walnut here. Um, there's been very little uh, domestication of that crop. Um, maple syrup, uh, of course, was, a, was the only real prominent sugar source in North America. There were no honeybees here. The honeybees weren't here either, uh, we'll, as we will see later in the, um, in the world tour. There were and are a host of wild berries in North America, some of which, like the blackberries, have been domesticated into a whole wonderful array of varieties. Uh, we also have wild raspberries, like these from the mountains of Idaho. We have wild res red raspberries around here, as well as wild black raspberries. Uh, and from those, of course, have come a, w a wide array of domesticated uh, varieties. Uh, we also have blueberries, as you know, high bush and low bush blueberries, from which these are the wild ones in Maine, but many domesticated crops have, uh, or varieties have been developed from our native blueberries. We also have native grapes. This is Vitus uh, riparia right here uh, in, in Iowa, uh, the native wild grape of the north. Um, we also have conquered grapes from out east that derive from wild ancestors. And just up here in Osceola, Wisconsin, we had this wonderful old farmer named Elmer Swenson who bred uh, the wild grapes with uh, European grape varieties and created wonderful varieties like Swenson Red and many of the wine grapes that opened up uh, wine, uh, uh, the wine industry in the whole northern tier of states where commercial grapes couldn't be grown before. As you saw in his, um, in his vineyard, he never kept a grape that didn't survive the conditions in this incredibly cold and uh, hostile environment. So that was what he was after, was, was northern hardy grapes. One of the only other crops that uh, we eat and that has been domesticated native to North America was the sunflower. This is what a wild sunflower looks like. Um, and from those small wild ancestors, we have these gorgeous, huge sunflowers that give us the edible seeds that we eat and press for oil and so forth today. Um, and also from those wild ancestors came all the beautiful, colorful ancestors, starting with Luther Burbank in Santa Rosa, California, who probably was one of the first to, to uh, develop um, some of the colorful sunflowers. But the sunflowers uh, also had been domesticated among the Native Americans and proliferated uh, among many of the tribes like the Hidatsa. Uh, this is the Arikara uh, sunflower, black-seeded sunflower, uh, drying among some of the Arikara uh, Native American squash. We also sell at Seed Savers one called Tarahumara White from uh, the Tarahumara Indians of Mexico. Another sunflower relative native to North America that has given us a food crop is the Jerusalem artichoke, um, uh, a native wild sunflower that makes little tubers like this that have been domesticated into much bigger 
and more tasty forms like you, those you see here. And that is just about it for North America. So what does that leave us? That leaves us everything else, uh, which is about 99.9% .9 of every fruit and vegetable that we eat uh, that came from somewhere else in the world. So we're going to uh, trace that journey in a, in a quick little flurry of activity, and we're going to move gradually southward, starting actually just north of the border in southern Arizona in the Tumacacari Mountains of uh, Arizona, a very dry, rugged mountain range where um, uh, Gary Nabhan and others at Native Seed Search uh, have long been studying the ancestral peppers called chiltepines, the wild peppers that are native to Mexico uh, that also occur uh, just over the border in these mountains of southern Arizona. And here we are on a field trip scouting around among the rocks looking for these plants of a very, very drought-hardy pepper, perennial pepper plants that produce these tiny little peppers about the size of a, of a pencil eraser. The seeds are probably uh, uh, transported by birds. Unfortunately, the birds uh, are not affected by the uh, capsicane heat uh, because these peppers, as Gary will tell you, who always wins the Chiltepin eating contest in Southern Arizona, um, they have something like 10,000 times the amount of heat as cayenne. So these are truly the hottest peppers, hotter than habaneros, they're, 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 they're wicked. Um, but it is from these tiny ancestors of capsicum annuum, the species, from which so much diversity has arisen. All of the hot peppers, here's just a little scattering of a few varieties of hot peppers, all these fantastic big sweet peppers that we're accustomed to, all evolved from these tiny ancestors. Over a lot of time uh, at the hands of tens of thousands and maybe a lot more backyard farmers and gardeners throughout history in the New World and eventually in the Old World as we shall see. Another crop that is native to the Southwest are uh, drought hardy tepary beans. Uh, another species of bean that uh, is, is uh, that's kind of a wild bean that grew in the deserts of the Southwest and was cultivated by Native American peoples in the Southwest and in, uh, in Northern Mexico. So let's move a little farther south now into Mexico itself um, where the blue agaves uh, are cultivated for tequila. And, uh, and we find ourselves largely, at least in Northern Mexico, in a very dry desert environment where many of these drought hardy plants uh, of the Southwest were cultivated for thousands of years by the indigenous people. Uh, one of the edible plants of that region is the prickly pear cactus, the Opuntia cactus, again, which Ber Luther Burbank got a hold of and um, developed the, the relatively spineless form, which is now the dominant food plant in this genus. It uh, produces beautiful fruits and also the rather spineless pads that are so popular in Mexican, Mexican cuisine. A little farther south, we find ourselves in the Sierra Madre Occidental, the western mountain range of Mexico, an incredibly rugged, complex uh, topography where the Tarahumara Indians have uh, been living for a very, very long time. And it's in these isolated mountain valleys and ridges with their little plots of farmland where um, so many varieties of vegetables have have evolved, have been selected and evolved, particularly beans. <clears throat> this is one of the beautiful beans from the Tarahumara uh, region. <clears throat> and if you go to a market in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you go to a market in the Tarahumara villages, you might find up to 25 varieties of beans in a single marketplace, just a tiny little village market. Try, uh, try that in any supermarket in America and count how many you find. And again, from this rich legacy of the common bean, Phaseolus vulgaris, that gives us most of the beans that we know, certainly the green snap beans and colorful snap beans and a lot of the dry beans, all of that has come from this wonderful legacy of Mexican um, and Central American uh, origin. 
Here's a selection of a variety of beans in the shell bean stage, a stage of eating beans that is not as popular in America as it is in Europe. But just look at the incredible color and diversity that uh, exists in the world of beans. Another crop that originated in that part of the world uh, are uh, some of the squash, particularly the species uh, pepo, pepo, uh, summer squash like uh, uh, zucchini and crooknecks and so forth. Um, this, this is a legacy from the wild ancestors that were, that were originally found in, in Mexico and Central America, moved up into uh, North America. The crookneck squash you see there were native, uh, uh, native varieties in North America by the time settlers arrived here. But they came from farther south originally. And also some of the winter squash we're familiar with in that species, delicata, acorn, and so forth, are modern varieties that developed from uh, indigenous uh, members of that species. And all the jack o lantern pumpkins that we're familiar with as well, um, and other shaped oddball uh, squash that I like to carve. Um, this picture, by the way, was taken many years ago at, a, at an autumn harvest party we had in California. And it was, and, um, it was during the Nixon years, and, and we were all standing there quietly watching the pumpkins uh, lit up together, and somebody said, you know, it looks just like President Nixon's cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> Another species of squash in indigenous to that part of the world is the species Moschata, and butternut is the most common one that we know uh, uh, in that species. But this species went overseas and became very popular in the Orient because it's a little more tropical and in Japan and China, this species just went nuts. And so we have all these squash like Kakuza and, and, uh, and many others that, um, Yokohama and some others that uh, come back to us from the Orient. Another native species from Central America is one with a long name, Argyrosperma. Uh, a very uh, rank grower, pardon me, which produces these edible seeds, uh, huge edible, edible seeds. Um, wonderful byproduct of growing squash, by the way, are the edible flowers that they produce. And there's nothing more wonderful than going out in the morning and picking a bouquet of sweet smelling squash blossoms and coming in and making a beautiful breakfast omelet with them. <coughs> So continuing our migration southward, we find ourselves in Central America. <clears throat> Here's a, um, an, a Salvadoreño farmer um, in, um, in El Salvador plowing his field. And on the volcano behind and all through the volcanoes of uh, Central America, uh, as, as one of the storytellers uh, last hour pointed out so wonderfully to us, uh, the farmers grow crops all the way up these volcanoes. and. Um, uh, all that altitudinal transect also gives a variety of habitats that have been selection grounds for so many of the variety, a varietal uh, uh, variation that has given rise to the crops that we enjoy from that part of the world. And now we can actually finally talk about the origin of corn because we've gotten far enough south to where, um, where corn actually originated. This is one of the wild ancestors of corn, uh, one of the strains of uh, a crop uh, called teosinte, uh, a wild grass that shares uh, much in common with corn genetically. And this is one of the uh, branched kind of bushy varieties of teosinte, but I also grew in California uh, the tall teosintes, um, which have hundreds of little ears all the way up, that's my son, Pippin, uh, who's uh, in this picture the same age as my grandson is now. Um, these are what the ears of Teosinte look like. Little tiny ears, no cob, just little, little triangular hard kernels all stacked up together. And these are the seeds that come out of those. And all of the farmers in Mexico uh, know about these crops. They kept them around the edge of the fields because the, in the land race uh, way of saving corn seed in, in Mexico and Central America, uh, these ancestral uh, strains were constantly infiltrating genes into the field and keeping the, um, keeping the crops um, healthy. 
and they, uh, they understood this even though they knew nothing about genetics. So really it's down in southern Mexico and, and, uh, so and Central America where corn originated. So these are Mayan varieties, essentially. Um, uh, actually, what we have here is some of the corns from uh, the Zapotec uh, in southern Mexico, but all through that area, southern Mexico and into, into Central America is where, the, is where corn originated. It then moved northward into North America and southward into South America. And so all the way down into Ecuador and Peru in the Andes, you have uh, wonderful long season corn varieties uh, as a result of, of the more southern migration of corn as well. But in North America, we have this fantastic legacy of Native American varieties that resulted from the diversity of selection as corn came northward and was grown among Native American peoples all the way up into northern North America. Uh, down in the southwest, of course, we think of corn as uh, such an amazing indigenous uh, crop. Here we're back to the Hopi uh, parching flower corn uh, over a fire. Um, and there you see the parched corn in the basket. Uh, flower corns are one category of dry corn, and then we have also dent corns and flint corns. But the flower corn is the main corn of Native Americans. Here she is making piki bread, making a slurry of flower corn and spreading it out on a hot stone and then peeling off this uh, wonderful parchment-like uh, piki, uh, favorite snack of, uh, of the Hopi. And then, of course, another category would be popcorns. And finally, much more recently in the evolution of corn, uh, the sweet corn that we all enjoy so much. So we're still in Central America. We're, we're going up now into the mountains. This is Lake Atitlan uh, in, uh, in Guatemala, uh, a very, very rich indigenous region <coughs> where so many uh, wonderful crops are grown. Higher altitude, much cooler. The home of the scarlet runner bean. This is where the scarlet runner bean originated in the mountains of Guatemala. Originally day length sensitive until the British got a hold of it in England and uh, kind of bred the day length out of it and gave us some of the wonderful varieties that we have today. And they include such a beautiful array of wonderful seed colors. Different species than the common bean. This is Phaseolus coccineus, um, uh, a very, very lovely bean from the mountains of Guatemala. Um, this is also the area where the lima bean originated. In spite of its name, it didn't come from Lima, Peru. Uh, it went south into Peru and north into North America, like all of these uh, Central American crops uh, eventually did. But look at that incredible array of genetic diversity in lima beans. You know, how many, how many lima beans have you ever bought in a store that look like this? The only frozen limas I ever saw were little greenish things that... Um, uh, I mean, we had no idea, or I had no idea till working at Seed Savers that we had this fantastic legacy of limas. And some of these, by the way, are Native American, Hopi varieties and so forth, came north and were adopted by, by um, Native peoples in North America as well. Um, down in the um, southern part of Central America, uh, you will find a couple of really the origins of a couple really hot peppers. Um, this is Tabasco, and of course the habanero peppers uh, are uh, indigenous to that region, but we think of these pe peppers more in conjunction with the Caribbean, so because that's where they kind of establish themselves culturally so strongly. And so let's just take a little journey over uh, across the water <coughs> to, the, um, to the islands in the Caribbean. And there we find uh, another crop uh, of origin, the sweet potato. And again, we have all these wonderful varieties that have proliferated uh, from, from that, uh, that time. And we also have those wonderful decorative ones. Those of you who grow gardens know about uh, margarita and uh, ace of spades and all the beautiful colorful leaved sweet potatoes too as well. Um, so, uh, continuing our journey southward, we find ourselves in the Andes. Now, when you think of the Andes, we tend to think of high mountains and snow-capped volcanoes and all of that. 
um, and uh, we'll get there. But let's start first with the dry regions of the Andes. Remember, the Andes are a rain shadow. And so on the west side of the Andes, away from the rainy Amazonian basin side, we find these desert regions. This picture was taken in southern Ecuador around a little town called Loja. Um, and it's really in these, um, in these dry regions of the Andes that the tomatoes originated from a number of wild ancestors, uh, 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 a species called Peruvianum, a species called Chilensis. The little current tomatoes you see here in contrast with the giant beefsteaks that eventually developed uh, is a species called uh, Pimpinella folium. Uh, but the real ancestor to the modern tomato that we know of uh, is a species called Esculentum. Esculentum just means edible. And uh, this is what Esculentum looks like. This is the wild tomato of Peru that is kind of the end. Just a little cherry tomato, basically. And uh, those are the kind of tomatoes that basically came up into Mexico uh, gradually and were eventually taken as uh, John Navazio pointed out so well in his talk yesterday, it was these kind of tomatoes that made it over to Europe in the first place. And most of that incredible selection that has given us this amazing diversity really happened in Europe, more than in, uh, than in, the, in the areas of origin. And so there was this amazing proliferation of varieties that then eventually came back to us uh, with all of the immigrant families uh, coming back from several countries in Europe where the tomato had become popular. And so uh, it is that we have so many wonderful immigrant stories now connected with tomatoes, German varieties and uh, Hutterite varieties and, uh, you know, varieties associated with, uh, s with specific cultures from Europe. And, of course, the beauty of growing these wonderful this wonderful diversity is all the things you can do with it in the kitchen. I mean, I love to make salads of all these colorful tomatoes and edible flowers. And uh, uh, so th that, that's, that's one of the great legacies that we have is now tomatoes that have so many different flavors and uses and so forth. Another interesting development that happened with the tomato is that behind the Iron Curtain, tomatoes were proliferating for a long time, but without much uh, contact with the rest of the world except for Cuba because of the communication that the Russians had with Cuba. And, and, and it was really in Russia that all of these wonderful brown and black tomatoes were developed. Um, this is uh, uh, Black Prince, uh, there's Black Crim, Black from Tula, all these wonderful varieties that we now have in commerce as a, uh, thanks to Seed Saver's efforts um, that came from the Soviet Union and, and some from Cuba as well uh, that um, that got there via, via Russia. Another interesting tomato characteristic that came uh, out of southern Mexico, um, uh, the Zapotec Indians were growing these ribbed tomatoes, tomatoes that have a lot of little hollow seed cavities. And those are the ancestors of all the wonderful hollow, hollow chambered stuffing tomatoes that we now have in all kinds of colors like green bell pepper and striped cavern and uh, yellow ruffled. Um, these are wonderful tomatoes that evolved from or were selected out of those genes of hollow cavities from the Zapotecs. And of course you can make these wonderful stuffed salads uh, with, these, with these wonderful tomatoes. Uh, a little side story that's interesting. This is a, a Fernandina volcano in the Galapagos Islands. And on every uh, mountain in the Galapagos uh, grows a, a variety of an indigenous species of tomatoes called uh, Chismanii. Uh, they grow right out of the lava in the most hostile environments. And it's very interesting to realize that in this remote place, uh, in one population of tomatoes uh, on the top of one of the volcanoes in the Galapagos, Charlie Rick, the famous tomato geneticist from UC Davis, who's had the largest tomato collection in the world, um, found the one gene necessary to produce the mechanically harvested tomato. <coughs> they needed a plant that ripened all the fruit at the same time and didn't have that little elbow where the tomatoes snap off and fall off. 
they had to be able to pick the whole plant in, in a combine and, and, and in a harvester uh, with all the fruit ripe at the same time and, and, uh, and none of the fruit falling off. So they were looking for a jointless tomato. And Charlie Rick scoured the, all of the Latin America looking for, for a jointless tomato. And this was the only mutation he was able to find on a remote island in the Galapagos. So we owe that was horrible uh, mechanically harvested <laughs> tomato to this little thing. I mean, it's an absolutely inedible tomato. It's, uh, I lived on these on a hike to the top of Fernandina one time, and uh, I had acid reflux for a month afterwards. <laughs> <coughs> so South America. Uh, just onshore from the Galapagos, we find Ecuador and Peru. Uh, here we find ourselves, of course, in the uh, land of the high Andes, uh, Machu Picchu in Peru, uh, with its wonderful agricultural terraces. Well, what were they growing? Uh, what were the Incas growing in those beautiful terraces at Machu Picchu? The same things that they grow in these fields uh, below the volcanoes all through the Andes of Ecuador and Peru, um, and that is, of course, uh, potatoes. This is the homeland of the potato. And here we have a wild potato, a different species than the ones we grow. There are lots of wild ancestors. Um, the center of origins of food crops uh, all have to do with um, finding the location of the most wild ancestors in the greatest diversity. And that's how we know that this is where potatoes came from. And this is what modern potatoes blossom look like, looks like. And of course, the blossoms make all these wonderful little berries. And if you want to drive yourself completely nuts, plant potato seeds because each berry has hundreds of seeds and every seed will produce a new variety. So uh, you, you can make all the varieties you want. And uh, that's, of course, why in South American markets in Peru and Ecuador, you find uh, many, many, many varieties of potatoes being sold in a single market. And... Uh, some of those have come to us, uh, back to us in the United States, like Peruvian purple, for instance, a, a very beautiful Peruvian variety. And it's from, those, uh, from that legacy that we have this amazing array of heirloom potatoes uh, at our disposal now in North America. Uh, this is also where quinoa uh, comes from. You know, another crop uh, indigenous to the Andes. It's a relative of, of, of goosefoot and lamb's quarters, uh, a very, very beautiful grain crop from that part of the world. And it's in South America that the um, big winter squash, Cucurbita maxima, had their origin. So this is really where all these wonderful uh, squash came from, like Blue Hubbard you see here in this photo. And again, this is a species that's traveled all around the world. We now have uh, wonderful varieties like this one from France. We have uh, Jaradale from Australia. Uh, we have, we have uh, a kabocha and red curry from Japan and, uh, and so forth. And that species also has given rise to all these wonderful big show pumpkins that people love to grow. So this is another legacy of, um, of South America in the Peruvian uh, Andean region. Also another species, of, a couple other species of pepper comes from South America, the hot peppers uh, in the species Bacatum, and uh, pubescens, the wonderful little hot peppers called Monsano. These are, these are uh, black seeded peppers that um, uh, come from uh, the mountains of South America. And also, South America is the home of the peanut. This is a variety, an old American variety called Civil War. Um, that was one of the early ones uh, in, in, in America. So after all of that, we've, uh, uh, we haven't even left the New World yet. We still have all the Old World crops, and we have just 15 minutes. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're, this is gonna, we're gonna have to astral project here pretty quick if we're gonna get around the world. So let's get on a tall ship real quick and head overseas to the land of the cathedrals and, uh, and old Europe where food has been grown for a very, very long time and have a look at, uh, at, at what um, had its origins there. Uh, here we find ourselves in a vineyard in Germany, in East Germany, overlooking one of the old German villages. And these are the wine grapes that originated in Europe, Vitus vinifera, 
uh, that then were brought over by immigrants uh, ac across the United States and finally to California, uh, where we have now these wonderful wine growing uh, regions and then went around the rest of the world, uh, Australia and Chile and other wonderful wine growing areas. That's a Native American, a Native European grape uh, that gave us this wonderful, wonderful selection of table grapes and wine grapes that we're all familiar with. Um, so here's a picture of Italian vegetables. And, uh, you know, we think of, of of vegetables associated with cuisines, with, with certain kinds of cuisine. I'm Italian. There's my Italian onion there that my family brought over and grew in the um, motherload country since, uh, since the gold rush days. Uh, but look what else we have. We have um, a garlic, I've already said, comes from Kazakhstan. We have tomatoes and beans and peppers in this picture that came from the New World. They're not Italian at all. Uh, the only old world vegetables in this picture are the, are the brassicas and the radicchio. So let's have a look at what the old world crops really are. Um, this species, Brassica oleracea, the, um, all, the, all the broccolis and um, cabbages, um, beautiful Romanesco broccoli, uh, an Italian variety, uh, cauliflowers, beautiful hybrid cauliflowers now that have been developed out of, uh, out of those old plants. Kales, all the different kinds of kales that then went to Japan and the Japanese developed all these spectacular uh, hybrid uh, uh, colorful varieties. Um, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabis, uh, all the members of that species originated in Northern Europe. I have tree collards at home in a pot that uh, come from the coast of the British Isles, perennial, perennial collards that uh, they are essentially wild collards that grow along the coast of, of England. Um, and also from the Mediterranean region come all those wonderful herbs that you're familiar with, oregano and uh, uh, thyme and sage and so forth, rosemary. These are all Mediterranean herbs that uh, come from that uh, European area. And this, of course, is where the honeybee comes from, from, um, uh, from the European uh, area. Uh, so we had no honeybees. Uh, Native Americans had no honey. This was a, a European import, um, but a very, very important part of our lives now uh, as pollinators of the crops that we depend upon. But really, it isn't Northern Europe that gave us that much to eat either. We have to go a little farther south into the Mideast. Here we find ourselves in, uh, in Egypt, uh, but let's just kind of think of this whole Fertile Crescent area, which is w really the origin of agriculture, and just have a quick rundown of some of the amazing varieties of, of food crops that come from there. Lettuce is indigenous to that region. Uh, this was a trial of all the lettuces in the Seed Savers collection uh, right out here in the field one year, just to give you an idea of the incredible diversity that we have uh, in the lettuce world. Uh, spinach comes from that part of the world. Beets, all the different kinds of beets. And the other thing that's in the same species as beets, of course, is, um, well, here's a beautiful Italian variety, for instance, Chiogia. So beets went all over Europe. They were well known as uh, Swiss chard was in Roman times. Um, <laughs> You recognize that girl, Karina? <laughs> if you want to see the adult version, she's sitting right back there. Um, <laughs> it's still a big chard leaf. <laughs> You've seen Karina a lot in this slideshow. <laughs> this is the uh, uh, bright light Swiss chard. Uh, a modern variety, but has all the different colors that are present in the beets and chard, uh, in the world of beets and chard. And uh, asparagus comes from there, uh, turnips, carrots. Uh, the original carrots were not uh, orange at all. As you know, Queen Anne's lace, the wild one, is white. A lot of the original carrots from uh, the homeland in Afghanistan and that part of the world were purple. And so um, orange is really a Johnny-come-lately in the world of carrots. 
we had a very interesting talk here a year or two ago at Seed Savers on the whole genetics and origin of carrots. Very interesting. Peas come from that part of the world. So we have all this diversity of peas, like snap peas and snow peas and you know, the edible potted varieties and soup peas. Uh, and the ones that we buy in their split form, uh, don't try to plant those. They're not quite good to plant. But uh, that's, a, that's a soup pea, an heirloom soup pea in the middle there. And then, of course, all the edible alliums, uh, leeks and garlic and onions and um, uh, all of those shallots and so forth come from the Middle East, from those dry areas of Persia and, um, and the Stans, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan. That's the world of melons. That's why we have so much trouble growing melons in Iowa. They don't like water. They're a drought a tolerant plant that comes from desert regions and um, they do best in really dry environments. So that's the homeland of, uh, of all the different uh, common uh, strains of, of melons. And apples have their origin, like garlic, uh, in, in Kazakhstan, in that part of the world. Uh, there are wild uh, orchards, managed sort of wild orchards, all through, um, all through the mountains of uh, that part of the world. So this wonderful uh, array of heirlooms we have here in our orchard at Seed Savers all owe their heritage to that part of the world. And now down in, uh, in the market in, uh, in uh, Cairo, we would find uh, a whole array of different kinds of, uh, of staple crops that originated in that part of the world as well in the dry regions of the Mideast. And we find the chickpeas or garbanzas native in that area. Uh, we find lentils uh, originating there, uh, and fava beans, which have become very popular up in um, the Mediterranean region and then came over with the Spaniards and are very uh, commonly grown in the Andes of South America as well. Um, if you go a little bit uh, farther east, you find yourself in the Khyber Pass as I did way back, that's me actually, uh, wandering around the Khyber Pass, um, um, obviously a long time before the Afghan war. Uh, but the Khyber Pass is one of the most uh, uh, important pathways of cultural, uh, after all, Hannibal went through with, there with elephants and India was colonized uh, out of the west through the Khyber Pass. It's just an amazing passageway, but in these uh, wild, dry hills uh, is where the olive originated. That's the homeland of the wild olives. And so all through uh, Europe now, uh, of course, we have in the Mediterranean region these gorgeous old olive trees, but they really had their origin. Uh, I saw whole mountainsides full of wild olives uh, in, in uh, northwest uh, India and the Afghan border regions. So that takes us through the Khyber Pass into India. And uh, there's some very important crops that originated there. Uh, let's have a quick look. Cucumbers, um, all the wonderful uh, eggplant varieties that we think of so much now in association with the Orient, with Japan and so forth. Uh, but, but actually, uh, they originated in India and then headed east into Southeast Asia and, uh, and the Orient from from the Indian subcontinent. Also, the cow peas originated there. Um, we think of these as being um, uh, southern varieties in America. Well, that's because from India, they went to Africa and were adopted by many indigenous people in Africa and then came to North America via the slave trade. And so it's that journey of, uh, of transit that got us all these wonderful cow peas that are common now in the south. Here's an, uh, an old heirloom called clay pea uh, from, from the deep south. And here's a Native American variety from the Papago. So you see how these things have traveled. I mean, all the way from India to the Papago Indians of the southwest. Um, India also gives us uh, the chicken. The red jungle fowl of, um, of India is the primary ancestor of chickens. I've seen them uh, running around in the woods in India in the wild and they look just like a little bantam, uh, bantam chicken. Um, there's some other wild 
uh, uh, chickens in Java and Indonesia and so forth, but the primary genetics comes from the red uh, jungle fowl of, of the Indian subcontinent. And of course, that's the homeland also of the peacock. So we'll go a little bit further. We find ourselves in Southeast Asia, um, where uh, there's been a great legacy of varieties coming over to, to uh, uh, North America, most recently through the uh, influx of, of Laotians and Vietnamese after the Vietnam War. Uh, we had a long history of Asian vegetables that, that uh, are important to us. One of them is sugar, sugar cane comes from Southeast Asia, and rice, of course. Uh, the homeland of rice is, uh, is Southeast Asia, and um, you know you have the most amazing construction project ever undertaken on the face of the planet, which is the um, rice terraces of Banaui in the Philippines, um, incredible agricultural area of rice growing. Um, and the soybeans that we see all around us here in our agribusiness fields also come from that part of the world, as, as do tropical beans like the azuki bean. And also this is the homeland of the radish. And um, the radishes have uh, proliferated, of course, all through the Orient. These are all winter radishes in this photograph. Um, and also many of the mustard greens that we associate with the Orient, uh, pak choys and sprouting broccolis and beautiful mustard greens from Japan and so forth, all come from that part of the world, including the wonderful headed uh, varieties that we call Chinese cabbage. And also the early plant explorers found uh, in China primarily in the uh, foot, uh, foothills of the Himalayas, uh, the wild um, uh, forms of citrus, the ancestral citrus that have given us uh, so much of uh, that, that we love. These are kumquats and Meyer lemons and all the rest. And don't forget also shiitakes <coughs> and uh, many, of, many of the oriental mushrooms that we have now from that part of the world. Um, and then last but not least, a, a very quick look at, um, at one last continent and that's Africa. And we will uh, finish our tour in that very large and wonderful place, starting in the north in the Sahara, where Gary Nabhan and I went uh, in the footsteps of um, ancient, uh, not ancient, but early plant explorers from the uh, 1900s. Here we are in the dunes of um, Siwa Oasis in the Sahara, uh, um, an amazing uh, agriculture that goes back uh, prior to uh, Alexander the Great's visit there. Um, this is the old village of Siwa overlooking plantations of olives and, uh, and dates, the two primary crops that are grown there. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous dates are grown in Siwa and olives as well. And these crops used to be transported across the desert by camel. Uh, some 10,000 camel loads a year of dates and olives were transported from Siwa to uh, Cairo and Alexandria uh, across the desert um, and it was only just a, f a couple of decades ago that a road was finally built uh, to see what see what oasis <coughs> this is in Egypt uh, this is in the um, the rift valley of Egypt where a whole series of oases uh, exist uh, way out in the middle of the Sahara it's a um, uh, a Berber uh, culture and surrounded by the Bedouins here, this is a Bedouin who actually managed the, the, uh, the camels out in the desert. But the Berbers themselves had this ancient uh, waffle garden agriculture perfectly adapted to the saline conditions of these oases. And some 35 crops were grown historically uh, and still are in these, um, in these desert areas. Now trucks bring in other crops like bananas uh, to Siwa, but the original indigenous agriculture still exists there. Um, and so f moving inland just a little bit, we find ourselves in Ethiopia. And uh, what are some of the African crops? Just quickly to look at them. Here's a, an Ethiopian market, typical market around a big old tree, uh, where you will find some of the crops like okra, indigenous to Africa. Uh, and of course the watermelon. 
Uh, we have watermelons in the south via the slave trade in the same way that we have cow peas. Uh, and um, so here we have our famous moon and stars watermelon that it came originally, the ancestors from, from Africa. And sorghums and broom corns uh, come from Africa as well. And then I want to end with a little view of, uh, of Vavilov or Vavilov as um, uh, as we heard yesterday from John Navazio, the famous uh, Russian plant geneticist who is credited with the centers of origin uh, idea of how to deci decipher where our food crops came from. He traveled all over the world in the first half of the 1900s collecting the varieties that ended up in the Vavilov Institute, uh, which was surrounded by the siege of Leningrad in, and uh, the famous story is that the scientists who were protecting the seed starved to death before they would eat the seed collection. But Babilov uh, um, traveled around and Gary and I um, uh, traveled in his footsteps to Ethiopia uh, to look for some of these indigenous varieties and see how well they were doing since he was there uh, in the early part of the 1900s. This is a seed collection in the Vavilov uh, collection in uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And this is a typical grain field in Ethiopia because this is the heartland of where wheats and barleys come from. This is the center of origin of those grain crops and every field is a different color because it's a different variety. Um, the ancestral wheat uh, looked something like this but today there are all these varieties that the indigenous people of Ethiopia are keeping. The entire country is harvested with sickles by hand, uh, as you see here, and the uh, grain is uh, shocked and put on the back of donkeys and taken to, uh, uh, back to the villages where it is thrashed with uh, cattle. And uh, then the grain is swept off off the ground and winnowed uh, and sold in market, and that's how the entire country uh, feeds itself. And in addition to that, there is an indigenous grass there called teff. And one of the reasons that there has been famine in Ethiopia is because at one point the Ethiopian government uh, forced the farmers to give up their native teff and plant corn. And of course, corn uh, is not drought tolerant, and as soon as there was a drought, there was massive starvation. Uh, but the farmers in Ethiopia are smart, and they kept their teff hidden away and now teff is back in style, and it's a tiny little grain of microscopic little seeds that they harvest, and with that they make this wonderful injera pancakes that you've all eaten if you've ever had an Ethiopian meal. And uh, this is what they look like with Ethiopian food served on them. Um, it is the staple of Ethiopia, a highly drought-hardy plant. They also grow a lot of lentils in Ethiopia. Just uh, lentils, remember, came originally from India. And here you see them, uh, the women um, uh, cleaning lentil seeds for sale. And last but not least, of course, Ethiopia is the homeland of the coffee, where they have coffee ceremonies, much like the Japanese have tea ceremonies. So that is the homeland of, uh, of coffee. So I want to end by uh, j uh, simply uh, reminding all of you that here we are in North America with our family stories, our heirlooms that come to us uh, with recipes and wonderful stories from immigrants who have come to America, uh, maybe stories some from indigenous varieties, uh, Native American varieties that also came here from somewhere else. This is a, a, a moving target, this whole thing about, uh, about varieties. So uh, let's just end with a few photos of this incredible diversity. Beans of the world. Um, squash from Central and South America that have traveled all over the planet. In this one photograph, there are variety, Native American varieties, varieties from Australia, Europe, Japan, North America, but they all originated in South America. So it is this fantastic legacy uh, that has given us um, the food that we have. And really, uh, as I hope you have heard over and over again this weekend, uh, it's up to us, you know. You are all now part of this network of millions of farmers and gardeners over time, throughout history 
throughout the world who have been uh, traipsing around the planet with their favorite varieties, trading them, growing them carefully, saving the seeds. You're part of this legacy and an incredibly important part. We thank you all for being here, for doing it. Thank you very much.